All right, y'all, thanks for coming. We're going to get this train departing on time here. Uh, I'm Andy, uh, and this is a talk about Scheme, but it starts out with being a bit of a, a talk about craft, in a sense. And like, because uh, I, I was thinking about like th 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 things that guile is like, uh, and, and there's some, some essence in all of these things that like, you know, woodworking and gardening, and like, I, I find many programmers that actually have attractions to these things. Uh, folks that are, you know, growing their own weird stuff and brewing their own beverages of all sorts uh, that, you know, make clothes and, and make furniture and all sorts of things. And, and what is it about it, about, about these activities, about these, these crafty activities that, like, binds them together? Like, is there some essence that, that makes some programmers or some practitioners uh, attracted to these practices, these crafts, and, and, and what's the deal, you know? So it's like, why do I like craft? Why am I in all these things? Why, do, why is my basement full of junk, you know, that I make this stuff with? And it's really like, there, there's, a, there's a pleasure involved in, in the production of many of these things. And one of the pleasures is, you know, just the process of, of making and building stuff. Also, after a day of being at the computer, you know, it's, it's good to make things in the, in the real world. But when you're done with the thing, you have like, you know, this, this result which was made, uh, hopefully with quality, obviously you get better with time, and that, that's another side of it, which is like, you know, even the process of starting something new, start, starting a new thing is like the best, right? Because you can only get better at it, right? You, you can start off bad, that's fine, you know, but like, as you get better and better, that, that you know, makes you, makes you feel better. And then like the, the result is, is made for you, for your use cases, for the thing that you, that, that you were thinking about when you, when you started the project. You end up with, with something that's made to fit you and, and not made to fit like some, some generic thing. And in contrast, like, I think there are things which are, which are not crafty. And I didn't put any on the slide because you, know, you don't want, want, want these things in text. But anyway, like if we think about uh, McDonald's, for example, right? Well, there, there's nothing really crafty about consuming M McDonald's food, right? It can form like a, a really valuable you know, like place in society and like, you know, can, make many positive functions it is food, it's not poison. Uh, but it, it's like, like there, there isn't this crafty nature there. And, and on the production side, which is, I, I think, okay, so one, it, it is about producing things more than about consuming things. But on the production side, I mean, you can't really get better at it, right? Like you get to this level uh, and you're designed to get to this level like really fast and you're designed like not to really progress in your production of, of, of McDonald's artifacts, right? And so in contrast, like a, a crafty thing is, is something that you can get uh, better at, right? It's made on, on a human scale in general, which is you know, why often we see people doing woodworking with uh, chisels and hand tools and, and planes and whatnot. It, it's, it's bespoke, it's not made like in a, in a generic way. Uh, and I'll, it, it manages to get both uh, touching roots in the sense of, um, Practices that survive into now that are historical in nature, like woodworking is a very old thing. But it's not like only looking towards the past, like it looks towards the future as well. And, and here I count like wearables as a wonderful like fashion, craft, electronic, for looking, you know, not so, you know, bound by tradition as well. Like, and I think that also has the crafty nature. And so thinking a bit more about craft, I, I of course, you know, looked it up. Uh, on the internet, okay, we got a bunch of definitions, and look, like, guile is actually, like, if you, <laughs> if you Google craft, like, this is what you get, right? So that, that's also kind of a crafty introduction to, to this talk. So, uh, again, I, I am Andy, and I, I co-maintain guile, and I have uh, co-maintained guile scheme, it's a language of mentation, since about 2009 or so. I've been programming in guile maybe since uh, 2003 or four, something like that. And, and the work that I do on Guile is generally working on its implementation. I, I use it a lot in, for, for many things, but the thing I, I enjoy, the, the craft that I practice is the, the, the craft of language implementation and building compilers. So I, I write about that on, on the website. Uh, so y'all check it out later. And, and this talk it has a thesis. And the thesis is that Guile is a language which helps you build programs which have this crafty spirit, uh, both in the practice and the product and everything else. So, Craft. Uh, so, start with a quick demo. Uh, right, are we here? Well, actually, uh, I'll go ahead and start up again. Uh, you started uh, here, I'm starting from the build directory. Uh, maybe I make it smaller so that it doesn't wrap. Maybe I'll uh, see if I can pull it off to the side here so we're not, you can see the whole thing. Right, so it's just, you know, guile prompt and it starts off with a standard 
FSF thing that says blah, blah, blah. OK, whatever. Right, so language, <laughs> we have numbers, which is kind of cool. Like we have you know, floating point numbers. We have like fractions and stuff. We have you know, complex numbers and things. And this is already kind of cool, because many of us work in languages where we just have these limited precision things that wrap around or don't or cause undefined behavior or whatever. OK, numbers, great. Uh, we, have, uh, we can give names to numbers. We can define x, 3. And the same define can define like a procedure. And here we use the famous lambda that everybody knows about here, lambda n. So we'll define, we'll say it's f, right? Lambda n plus, I don't know, n2. Something like that, right? And we have the standard, like, smaller syntax. We can just, like, these two last lines are exactly the same, right? Just one sort of a uh, alias for the other. If I type in F, I get F. It presents up procedure. OK. So uh, in Scheme, as we know, we start procedure applications with a parenthesis. So if I do F of 3, that's a procedure call. And then you also have, like, the data. So you have, like, a quote before, and that's what we get. Um, right, so that, that, that's, that's it, right? So we're done, right? So thank you for my talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, thank you. So the, the thing is, is that um, you, what you need is not just like the, the small language. So, so we're gonna talk about uh, the, the arc of the talk goes from small programs to big programs and the crafty nature in small and large. But what we need is not just like Wood, you know, like here's some wood, go build a, a thing, right? You need some more than that, right? You, you need some tools, you need like a workbench and stuff. This is a print from the 18th century of a uh, joiner's workbench in, in France, uh, Marc Andre Rubo. And as you can see, these aren't just actually tables. If you look closely, they have holes for putting in pegs to hold wood against, to stick some clamps in so you can clamp your wood down. You've got vises on the side. And so that's what the REPL is actually for us. Like I can, uh, I don't know, let's, let's for example, uh, if I get a problem, right? So let's say I'm gonna map F over the list, one, two, three, four, right? Okay, I get a, a nice, nice result. What if I like put five at the end, right? So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be like adding two to five. Okay, I get an error, but it's an error in like a recursive uh, REPL, at which point I can do my backtrace, I can go to like frame three, I can print out my locals, and I have no local variables. Yeah, sorry, that's all the, do I have any anywhere, anywhere else? Maybe I have them uh, fr0, do I have locals? No locals here, there you go. Well, the optimizer optimized them out. Uh, it's just a classic GDB thing, I, th I think, in the end. But this is obviously Giles' uh, REPL here. We also have uh, a number of other tools. We have profile, we can profile expressions. We can disassemble our functions, we can set breakpoints, we can time things, we can see what the macro expander does, we can see what the optimizer does also. One level of the optimizer, because we, we bolted on another one underneath that's kind of harder to uh, express in scheme. Uh, we can look at uh, backtraces as we see. And most importantly, there's help, which can show you all the things that you can do. So it's, it's like our, our workbench for making small programs. And we spend a lot of time in Guile just at the REPL, testing things out, building our programs incrementally, as we all do here at Strange Loop. So, so the, the, the problem is, is like how do you take like a small program or small thing and you make it bigger, but you, you want to preserve this like crafty nature, right? Like how can we preserve that, that quality a, 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 as we go bigger? The next step up from like REPL, like calculator style interaction, I, I think of it as scripts. And for me, a script, uh, well, OK. So if, uh, yes, scripts. But first, a little story time. All right, so this is a picture of my garden from earlier in uh, summer. So things aren't like as rampant and big, nor are they as dry as they are now, because we've had a drought for the last little bit. And I, I've just been gardening for about four years or so. And it's been wonderful, because you get better at it, right? Like, also, like. Things, different things happen in different years, and, and you get to eat the product. Uh, but one thing I learned with, with gardening is that like, as you start to make gardens, you can't just like, make an undifferentiated thing. Like, you need, they need to be like rooms outside, habitable spaces for people. They need to have structure in, in, in which you inhabit the garden as a person so that you can enjoy it. Not only do they produce the thing you want, but they should be nice places to be. So the, the structuring bit uh, that we were going to use to start to go from calculator style interactions to scripts would be, let's say, let's pull in some modules, right? So we can pull in like our pattern matching module that helps us match over data structures. Now we can pull in some web modules. And so here we have, okay, after having used the modules, um, 
we match on our program arguments, we fetch this URL, we get back the, the headers object and the body, and we can display the body to standard out. So we've like, done a little simple web client. And for me, like, a, a script is this. It's like a few pages. Uh, it uses modules. We have a number of modules for lots of sort of standard use cases, standard batteries. The POSIX support and Guile is great. Like, I think that's like where it's, um, it's best niches in a way. Like, it is a, a scheme that fits very much into POSIX and Unix and such. We also have, you know, obviously the web is the new POSIX in a way, right? The, the standard on which we make our programs. So we have, you know, the client libraries, the server, and all your HTTP stuff. Uh, we can deal with input and output, not only in, in bytes, so in that regard, going, you know, uh, like you can do character input and output, but all encodings, right? And it's, it's not common, as common as it should be, right? <laughs> in addition, you know, we can talk you know, standard data formats and, and libraries and data and stuff. And there's a manual. It's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages long. It's all right, you know, so ch check it out. That'll definitely help, like, make, make that step. So a script is a few pages of code, uses modules to do its job. That's what I think of as a script anyway. But when we think of like a program, I think of like, I'm, I'm going to grow this to something even bigger, so I, I can't just have like one page, right? I, I need to like break it into like rooms that I can you know, construct and then arrange together. So that's to me what a program is, and that's, that's sort of next step, native modules. And yeah, here, here's my thesis. I, I don't actually think anyone knows what a system is. <laughs> you have to do basic science on a system to determine like what it's composed of and how does it perform. So, so uh, the, to, to move from scripts to programs, we, we need to, like, a bit more rigidity, so we apply a few techniques. One is separate compilation. We can compile and test our, our different modules uh, separately. And uh, we have uh, tooling that as you evolve uh, your system with modules, as you move from scripts uh, to programs, as you break into separate parts, you're going to need to evolve those things in different ways, right? You're going to need to deprecate interfaces. Different people are going to be managing different p parts. So, uh, we have uh, excellent uh, keyword argument uh, facilities to sort of uh, progressively enhance the more functional procedural interfaces between modules. Our compiler warnings are pretty good. We, you can determine when you're calling something with not the right number of arguments or with a keyword that's not supported or with variables that aren't referenced. It's OK, right? Uh, and, and they definitely help. Um, and we have facilities for, for deprecating interfaces and saying, you should be using this one instead. So they do help you migrate your, and, and grow your program, like keeping a uh, nice structure, uh, but also a, con uh, a continuous flow from, from scripts uh, on over to programs. Um, and, and yeah, so we, we used to talk a lot about scripting languages, and I, I think it's an, an anachronistic historical category, right? It's a language that um, doesn't, that that's, you can add strings and numbers, and that doesn't perform well, right? So that, that to me is what a scripting language is. And, and there, should, there should not be this gap between like, real language and scripting languages. There should just be languages that uh, can, can perform well in their domain, right? in, in their entire domain. So in the future, I, I don't think this is a category of language that, that will exist. Or, or that describing your, your language as a, as a scripting language, um, maybe we just don't mean the same things. Like, it should just be a language right? that you program your whole system in. Um, and, and, and to, to bridge the gap, again, going from small to large, you're going to have performance requirements, right? How is your program going to, at some point, you're going to have different metrics you need. You need like certain memory consumption, you need certain startup time, you need certain throughput. And am I going to be able to stick with this language that I started with making these nice interactive calculator-like experiments, uh, growing into scripts and growing into programs isn't going to be able to actually bridge that gap. And, and Guile's speed is OK right now. I'm not going to claim like we're you know, beating the entire world, but it, it's, it's definitely all right and getting better. So I, I did some testing earlier. Uh, allocation rate, pretty OK, almost gig a second. Uh, and, and actually, the, the speed, we, you can think of it mostly, it's, it's limited by, it's a bytecode interpreter still. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later. We have a custom virtual machine, and, it, and our speed is generally limited by instruction retire. And, like That's a very good metric to to, to think about like how fast is it going, and we can do you know four or five hundred uh, million instruction retimers uh, a second. If you start it, you saw me start it. Starts up pretty good, and if you do, uh, if you check out the memory usage, um, and this is with 64-bit uh, words, uh, it's about two two and a bit megabytes at the start. So it's okay. And one of the tricks we use to get good memory usage is that we actually compile our modules to ELF format, like the ELF format that. Uh, Linux uh, shared libraries and programs use. 
And, and we use it not because we want to interoperate with other tools, because horror. Why would you ever want to depend on anyone else's code, right? <laughs> so it's more like Elf has made a lot of really good decisions. And thinking about how you would encode your compiled output into Elf helps make performance systems. Um, and so in particular, Elf is designed in such a way, all these uh, horizontal lines are, are a page, a four kilobyte page. And the, the biggest bit is the program text being the bytecode. And then follow that is a read-only data. And the other big section is um, the gray bit, which uh, has some uh, metadata that needs to be relinked at, at runtime. So only like some of this will be uh, actually uh, per process overhead. The rest will be shared uh, entirely between all your processes with no additional overhead. And then at the end, we have actual dwarf uh, debugging information. So when we need to determine what function is this instruction in, we do the dwarf lookup in the, in the side table. And we don't need to do this normally, obviously. Uh, but still, it's pretty fast. So we're able to like, you know, keep our good debugging, but our memory consumption down. Um, right. But Andy, you know, why what, this instruction retire rate, this is trash. Why, why are you telling me about this thing that makes no, no meaning? You know, how, how do I actually, you know, what, what, is the, what is the performance really, Andy? Well, it's, it's hard to answer, right? So I, I work on compilers for a living. And <laughs> so, so I have a license to micro benchmark. <laughs> because like, you need to know what you're testing, right? So I just need to test, like, I've looked at the, the decompiled, uh, I've looked at the assembly for C for, for this loop up to a billion case. I've looked at the assembly for scheme. And I just want to test like how fast can I loop up to a billion, right? It's not a real world test, but it does give you a lower limit on some, some compilation, right? Like, like how fast can you imagine yourself going uh, on, on a general order of magnitude scale? On the Python side, I, I think this does the right thing, uh, but I'm not as good in Python as I used to be. So I, I'm not going to. You, you can throw out my numbers for Python if you like. So that's just Python 3. So per iteration, I, I did a measure on this uh, about a month ago or so. And, and I, in Python 3, uh, about 80 cycles. Gal 2, uh, a little bit faster, but on the same order. Uh, so for, for some early compiler hackings, it was OK. Uh, we have Gal 2.2 coming out very soon. Actually, we released the latest pre-release 2.1.4 uh, last week. Um, doing much better. I, I think the, the recent compiler and virtual machine work is success in that regard. And then I tested against GCC. OK, so GCC-0 produces trash, like bad assembly. And, and it ends up in, in this you know, 5.6 cycles per iteration, just, it, uh, just to increment a number. If you do dash 01, you get the, the increment and jump loop that you expect. And if you ever do like serious performance work, you're, you're going to be measuring instructions per cycle. And if you get to 4, then like ask for a bonus, right? Because you're doing your job, right? So GCC01 does produce the optimal code pretty much at about 0.8 uh, cycles per iteration. So it means we're off by about a factor of 15 from sort of a peakish speed. GCC02, of course, um, this loop, it doesn't do anything, so it optimizes it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we will catch up on C. I, I ain't going to say we're going to like beat it or anything, right? Because there are so many considerations here. Uh, but when we start, uh, we have a, a decent compiler now. So we're going to do a decent ahead of time job uh, and emit native code. And that will come in, I don't know, a couple of years or something. Uh, so, so that's like where it's going. But there are some places that you know, we're not going to really catch up on C, right? Like we're, we're just going to leave <laughs> some of C's features behind. OK, so uh, right. Uh, Let's go a bit, a bit bigger in a way. So right now, it's very classic. You know, how do you build small programs that, that run fast? But is it web scale? You know, like, does it scale out? Uh, so what we do have for horizontal scalability is not only the POSIX normal fork and exec and all that. We have POSIX threads as well. They work pretty well. Uh, we have no uh, gil. Um, I, it, it's, it's hard to recommend it because we don't have a, a right now a baked in uh, nice concurrency, reliable concurrency support. Uh, but that's a new thing. So I'm, I'm going to not answer this question right now, because I'm going to defer it. I'm going to make a, a bit of drama, right? Uh, so I'm going to answer two unrelated questions in, in the meantime. So tools we have to take your program, uh, like to, to help it scale up. So the first one is macros. And I don't have to talk very much about this, because it's a strange loop. The second one is prompts. And I, I think maybe not most folks have worked with these. These are also known as, as delimited continuations. Have any of you all programmed in a system with delimited continuations? All the racketeers are raising their hands, aren't they? Like, <laughs> hands down if it's not in racket. Like, delimited continuations somewhere else. Anybody? No? OK. All right. 
Okay, it's good to know. This is about a third of the room for the video, something like that. You racketeers, y'all. So, <laughs> uh, macros, I just touch on it. I say, they, they, they let you cut your program to fit your problem, right? That's, that's the general thing. Uh, I know you know all, all the patterns and how all they work, but that's, that's the crafty nature uh, of macros, that they produce a, a bespoke thing that fits you, that allows you to creatively, concisely uh, uh, express yourself in, in a way that, that uh, it's pleasing, right? Okay, so that's macros. I'm not gonna talk more, more about that. But I am gonna spend some more time on prompts. Okay, so every program is an operating system to another program, almost, right? Like there are very few programs that are really on the, on the leaf of, of, of this graph. And, and when you run your program at, at the command line, here I have uh, the sort of TCSH uh, percent sign there. Uh, as a, in a reason I'll explain in a minute, you have like the left side, which is the operating system in effect, the shell, and you have the right side, which is the program you're running, which is sort of user space process. And the fact that the left side is actually another user space process is not really relevant, right? The fact that only the kernel can make the operating system boundary that we think of it that way is, a, is again, a historical accident. Like, it's just programs that contain programs that run programs that provide different levels of isolation and abstraction for sub-computations. So what, what Guile has, and what Racket has also, are prompts, which are delimited continuations, so they're the same thing. Uh, and, and the continuation is delimited by the prompt, right? Because when you, when you run program, it doesn't really reference its parent. It only references that in like some bookkeeping sense, but it doesn't include in its address space where it was called from. Uh, it, there's been like a division which is made, in this case by the fork and exec VE call, uh, between the, the outside and the inside. Uh, so you have system and you have user. And you see this in, in a smaller scale in many other programming languages, like even try catch in a way is a, is a delimit of continuations. You have the thing that you're, that you're trying, that you know that something's gonna raise an exception. And you have the system code, which is all the non-italic stuff here, which, which handles the exception. Uh, you're making a barrier between two parts of the program in a, in a kind of dynamic way. So prompts uh, provide this facility in a language, uh, in a very generic way. And the three things that I see prompts as doing, like the three facilities which they offer to me, are uh, early exit, uh, they offer a coroutine-like facility, and they offer non-determinism. I'm not gonna talk about this last one, uh, but I'm gonna give a couple examples of, of the first two. So here is making a prompt, right? We, we're going to include the module which has a bunch of this prompt-related stuff. It, it's called Ice9 Control, and the prompt looks like the prompt. It's really a pun on TCSH, right? And as this was introduced by Matthias Fleissen, Dorai Sidram, and all these folks uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and this is the way that, that I like to understand it. There are a number of formulations, shift and reset and various things, but, but this, is, this is the way that, that makes me understand it. So I hope that uh, I'm able to convey uh, my understanding to y'all. So there are two parts. There is the thing that we're putting inside the delimited continuation. And then there's a handler. So the expert is inside. And then the second thing, the handler is outside. In this case, the handler will receive this K argument that I'll talk about in a minute, and then all the other arguments, and it's going to return false. OK. So actually, that percent, um, it's not the primitive. Uh, our primitive is call with prompt, like racket, right? Um, and, and that percent macro is a macro that expands out to this. So you're welcome, right? <laughs> so. Uh, each prompt is identified by a tag, it, like identifying that location, that delimit between user and system. And then we include the body, uh, which is actually a thunk, which is actually inside a lambda. And then the handler is there as it was before. So tag, body, escape handler. So to, to use prompts in an early exit way, uh, we abort to the prompt. So you establish your prompt with your call with prompt. And then this abort to prompt call is going to abort to the prompt name tag uh, with the value 42. So 42 is going to be the one which is passed as our early return value, and, and then we return. So this, this plus three bit, like, it never really happens, right? We abort the, the computation at that point, and then we return uh, from the handler. Because uh, we return the 42, uh, yeah, everybody knows this stuff. But this is a very common pattern to be able to early, uh, to return something early. So let's put it in a module, right? Let's start to 
you know, separate our things and build them up. We're going to make our module, and we're going to export this macro called with return. So with return is going to take an identifier return, and then it's going to contain some body expressions. And in there, we're going to make a tag, uh, and we run the body, and then the return returns the values. But the, 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 neat, the neat thing is this, this return is in scope of the body. And it's a function that when you call it, it will return those values. So uh, you can say with return, return plus three, return 42, which is, I think, a, a much nicer way of saying this. And since it's a function, you can actually map it over anything, pass it to inside things. So you can return from that function frame from many nested call frames, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and what it returns depends on the uh, order in which map uh, goes over one, two, or three. It's going to return probably one or three, but it depends on which way map is going to, which one it's going to map first. In this case, it's going to be one. Uh, but I just know that because I wrote map, you know. So. <laughs> So what about this k argument? That, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, early return means you don't need to actually come back in. But that k is, um, what happens is when you abort, the remaining part of that continuation between the prompt and the abort place is bundled up into a function. And that function is the delimited continuation. It is passed as k. Uh, and that's like the meaning of the rest of the program until the prompt, right? So it's delimited by the prompt. So for example. Uh, all right, we have a, our, our function f, we make our tag, we call with prompt tag, and then our body is plus three, we abort to prompt. And in this case, we're going to abort with no extra values, and so the continuation that we return is that continuation. It's plus three box, right? Like plus three something. Like it's literally the same. Like those things are literally the same. There's lambda x plus three x, and this continuation, which we return here, those are, they're the same. Right? And so if I, if I bind that k to f, plus 3 and 1 is 4, plus 3 and 2 is 5. And so, right, when a delimit continuation suspends, and, and this is something that took me a while to understand, the first argument to the handler is a function that can resume the continuation. And I don't know, like Ruby has call CC. Sometimes schemers talk about call with current continuation. I guess many of y'all have heard about this thing that scheme has always had continuations and we're better than you. And that. Yeah, so it's trash, right? Because this, this operator, uh, this delimited continuation operator is so much better. And <laughs> call CC is not a function. The continuations which you get when you, um, in, in delimited continuations and call with prompt, you can call them and they return. The continuations you get in schemes call CC, you call them, it doesn't return, right? You just like jump off into the ether. It's not composable at all. So for that reason, these continuations are sometimes called composable continuations. Right, so what can you do with them? Well, uh, as you can see, you can suspend a computation and come back. And that's exactly what you need for modern evented IO uh, servers of all kinds. So what we have been building uh, recently and, and just, I don't know why we did it so late, to be honest. I, I actually, I, I do know a reason, but uh, we, we have lightweight fibers now. So in addition to kernel threads, we have lightweight fibers, which are user space threads, built as a library, entirely as a library, not baked into the core of Guile at all, uh, which are threads which suspend when they would block. And they would, there are three ways right now that they could block. Uh, one would be asleep, obviously. Another would be Maybe they want to read some bytes from a port or write some bytes out to a port. And that's the reason why it didn't happen until now. Because in order to be able to suspend, you have to, everything in between has to be in scheme. You can't like trampoline through C and come back because then you're saving like a C stack frame and, and you can't put that back on the stack, right? So uh, if you would write to a, a port uh, with bytes or read and, and you can't do it, then it suspends, adds that file descriptor to an epoll set. And when the file descriptor becomes readable again, then you resume the thread. Uh, so that means the state for a fiber is small. It's like a handful of words. Uh, and it's really wonderful. You can have like, you know, many, 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 many of these. We additionally have uh, channels, um, but it's new, so we're, we're kind of, it's kind of like baby's first concurrency in a way. I feel real dumb when I'm working with this stuff. It's like, is this going to work? Is this going to work? <laughs> it's, it, it's nice to be able to experiment it uh, with a, a very low level of commitment uh, because it's a library. Like, we can make mistakes. Uh, but since our core primitives, uh, the call with prompt stuff has been around for 20 years, it's going to work okay, right? So if this library doesn't work out, then something else will work fine. The cool thing about this is that, like, in JavaScript, for example, 
uh, you need to add asynchronous something to this. Well, you're going to have to break it into callbacks or break it into promises or transform all your functions from being of type T to promise to type T or async this or that. It works transparently. We have the web server, which we wrote in Scheme in a very normal, imperative way. Uh, but uh, composing that with uh, the prompts facility means that now we can actually, instead of serving one request at a time, we can spawn off a little fiber for every different client. And, and we're no longer like vulnerable to that slow loris attack where somebody like feeds you bite by bite by bite. So it's pretty cool. We really enjoy it. So yeah, here's an example of a, a simple client server, but y'all have all seen you know, the spawn pattern in Erlang and Go and, and wonderful languages like Tulip and everything else. So I, I assume this is very normal for y'all. If you um, show something like this at a JavaScript conference, it, it doesn't really work though. Because <laughs> everybody's like, where are the callbacks? I need my callbacks for speed. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right, so uh, are we web scale? I, I don't know. <laughs> so so I, I wrote some, some simple programs. And uh, a little ping would get maybe 50,000 you know, backs and forths per second per core. And a little HTTP server, including parsing all the headers to proper scheme data types so you're not dealing with byte strings or anything like that. It's about 10,000 requests a second per core, which is OK. You know, It's probably not the bottleneck in your program. So flight suits and victory, right? Uh, something like that. So we're, we're doing OK. Right. So work in progress. Lots of stuff to be done. Experimentation. Um, it, it's, a, it's an active area of development. Uh, and we'll, we'll see. Yeah. So this is one place you can check it out. There are two or three other folks prototyping libraries like this. Since it's done also as a library, you can have different event models, like integrating with uh, UI event loops, like GTK event loop or something like that as well. OK. And finally, um, and, and we're drawing yeah, a little close to time. So as we scale even more, like web scale, maybe we need to like orchestrate, right? Orchestrate. It's a big word, right? Orchestrate. So we, we have a really cool thing now, and it's, it's wonderful. It's driving a lot of folks to Guile, which is great. I like anything. It's driving folks to Guile. Or attracting or driving. Which, which way is the positive way? Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so there's this project called Geeks. And Geeks is like Nix, if anyone has heard of Nix. It's a declarative system for declaring uh, what a package is and how to build it. And if anything uh, changes, it will end up rebuilding things. So, so Geeks is like Nix, except instead of being uh, the Nix language on top of Perl and Shell and Awk and all these things that are embedded in, in the Nix language to build packages. Everything's in Guile, actually, the, the whole thing. And there's 4,000, 4,500 packages now. Uh, super huge velocity, I, I think, I don't know, for, for the project right now. Uh, and, and so this is how I, I am going to be declaring and uh, installations, making virtual machines, making containers, and everything in the future. And, and it solves one problem, which is how do you build a Docker image, right? It's like you don't start with a base image and then modify it and mutate it. With something like Geeks, you can actually declare like what are like the different components and then build them up constructively instead of from an unknown, maybe not reproducible base and then mutate things. So that's a pretty rad new development. And uh, I definitely suggest that folks check it out. OK, uh, so well, a little bit early because uh, I, I speak pretty fast. But the website has been redone recently. I don't know if, if you all have seen the, the lovely new website. It, I, it's, it's very nice. So go, go and check it out. We have an IRC channel, uh, which would be very happy to see you all in. And when you make a thing, and make a thing, uh, share what you make. You know, come on, like, let us know what's going on. So since we're a little early, if anybody's got questions about what's going on, hit me up. What's up? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so um, there's no stop the world pauses. What happens is, uh, well, OK. So the, um, we use the bomb collector. <laughs> it, it's a little bit shameful, but, but it works real well. Right? So we have thread local free lists. The allocation rate, as you see, is fine. You can turn on incremental mode. The mark phase is in parallel. To stop the threads, it sends a signal. Right? So it is, you can inhibit that in some ways, uh, but, but yeah. Tends to work, yeah. This is a good, bad, short answer. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else? If not, yeah. I, I've seen Gal mentioned in, in relationship to the new make. Mm -hmm. you, but I didn't quite understand the relationship there. Can you so on that? I have not yet programmed 
GNU make things in Guile. GNU is um, it's narrative causality, right? It started with a story, and then the software was generated by the story. Right? So in GNU, you have like projects which are sort of loosely coupled in a very technical way, but like more coupled in a narrative way. And that narrative way somehow infected the mind of the make maintainer, who decided to add uh, Guile extensibility in, in, uh, in make. So you, there's like a little keyword that you can run, like dollar, open paren, Guile, I think, to run Guile code inside make. How it works, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like Kisilyov, maybe. Like, yeah. Make is a functional language, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, like, back in the day, there was something called the Esteem Shell. Yeah. Um, you made a lot of, uh, like, Guile and POSIX, and um, sort of, uh, what are your thoughts around, like, uh, Guile sort of moving up a level and becoming the shell? Um, so the question, I apologize for not re repeating questions before. The question was about Guile and, and Scheme Shell, and could Guile move up a level? Could it be a nice shell? Um, so we have a lot of facilities which are directly modeled from Scheme Shell facilities, and even some stale references in the manual to like, if you're familiar with Scheme Shell, this is like that, which nobody's familiar with Scheme Shell. So I don't know <laughs> why they're there. It's an old project, and we have lots of little historical things. Um, as the question is, is Guile a good shell? I think um, it's a great shell for Guile, like for, for Guile programs, but is it a good shell for processes and stuff? You can make a language, but I, th I think it's hard. I, I, have a, I have a hard problem with uh, parentheses on the command line. I don't, I don't know if that's heresy for <laughs> a Guile maintainer to say that. So I don't know if it would work very well. Um, I, I suspect that some other language might be more... Uh, more appropriate, but I don't know. Yeah, definitely give it a try, though. You know, report back, share what you make. Yeah. This is funny because I'm actually the current Skish maintainer. Oh, right on. <laughs> <laughs> Skish maintainer. <laughs> I was wondering. I was wondering. If, so you said that uh, Guile is pretty good POSIX support. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how like extensive it is. Like, can, do you have access to the sort of APIs that would like that I would think would fuck up? how Scheme itself works, like changing uh, buffering on uh, problem surface directly, that sort of thing? Yeah, so the question is, like, um, do we have access to like dangerous pos POSIX? And the answer is generally yes. Um, so you can change buffering on file descriptors and such. You can use those same interfaces on ports, which are, have their own user space buffer, like uh, C standard IO ports, uh, and it more or less does the right thing. Uh, in, in the sense of like sometimes you, you want to use that same interface both on a buffered scheme object and on a file descriptor. File descriptors are incredibly dangerous, like in a scheme program, right? We recently added something, uh, file descriptor finalizers. It'll be called before Guile closes a file descriptor. I, I was surprised that wasn't, wasn't added before, but like obviously with multi-threading, it's an issue. Yeah, so we have dangerous scheme. <laughs> if you need to provide like a, a safe subset to, for users in some context, then you need to like construct that environment out of only safe things. But I think most, most production languages have that problem in the sense that like always you can use FFI unsafe or, or, or whatever, yeah. So there's something, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, do I have internet here? Uh, actually, th so there's some internet. If you search for uh, E. Craven, E C R A V E N, uh, there's someone who did a bunch of benchmarks over a bunch of schemes. Uh, if you search for his R7 RS benchmarks, which is a subset of schemes, the question was, is Guile slow? Right? Um, so Guile was slow. And, and the weird thing is, we had convinced ourselves that we, it was so fast, you know? <laughs> So for, when I started with Guile, it was, of course, with the modular synthesizer project, as many of you, like starting with your programs, do. It's like, I'm going to make this modular synthesizer. I'm going to make it in really nice language. I'm going to make it with scheme with flexibility and C for speed, which was so dumb, right? Because like, languages don't have speed, right? <laughs> it's implementations which have speed. And if I, if I did it over again, I probably would have started with a more proper scheme and some, because like, Guile was maybe less proper at that point. Uh, so, uh, in 1.6, 1.8 days, there was just an interpreter. In 2.0, sort of basic compiler. In 2.2, the compiler is now quite nice. 
we beat all other interpreted schemes, more or less. Like, uh, all, um, well, more or less, right? So I'm not gonna say, every scheme is beautiful, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, we're, we're beat, uh, sometimes we beat schemes that compile to C, like chicken, but only on some benchmarks. Generally, the schemes that have a JIT or do native compilation beat Guile. So I, I am hoping, our compiler is all right now. So I'm hoping that like, once we start to lower things down to assembly, skipping the C step entirely, uh, that we're going to be up at the, the, the top. But that's hubris also, so I, it's not science at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you all for coming.